and welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Norman Lamb and I'm chairing this session. Um, I wanted to start by thanking the Centre for Mental Health for putting on this uh, series of um, sessions under the Festival of Ideas. Um, if you want to introduce yourself in the chat, uh, please do so. Um, the chat will be open uh, for the moment, but closed during uh, the presentations. Uh, I should also say that we're recording the event uh, so that it can be shared afterwards. So for our third Festival of Ideas event, we'll be joined by experts who've been involved with organisations that have taken innovative approaches to better support children and young people and hear their thoughts on how we can build an effective mental health system for children and young people. Uh, just uh, to start also, I'll give you my two minute thoughts on this subject uh, as chair. Uh, and I should also say that I chair the uh, South London and Maudsley um, NHS Foundation Trust and have recently stepped down as chair of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition. My thoughts are as follows. I, I mean, I, I think we have a, a pretty broken and dysfunctional um, treatment uh, system under the CAMS service across the country, which I think routinely fails uh, families. Um, it's characterised by high thresholds to even get on a waiting list and then very long waiting lists before you can get help if you are sick enough uh, to qualify to go on the waiting list. Uh, everyone within the system preaches the principle of early intervention but the way the system actually works, it almost guarantees the latest possible intervention when people are in a moment of crisis. Uh, and so I think the need for change is long overdue. Uh, the principles I think we should apply are that we should focus far more than we have hitherto on how we can prevent uh, ill health amongst children and young people. Uh, and I think we need to keep improving our understanding of the main drivers of mental ill health and also mental distress amongst children and young people. I think we need to be willing to learn from uh, other countries and what they have done to uh, uh, reform their system for responding to children and youth mental ill health and also critically learn from some of the great innovation that's happening across our country, some of which we will be hearing about uh, today. Could I just ask you incidentally to mute your mics uh, because we are getting some uh, noises off. Um, I think it's also very important that we recognize that we should start at year zero, if not before taking a whole life approach. Uh, too often we don't focus on the damage that can be done to children uh, in those very early years. Uh, and there are very good evidence-based programs that can support uh, children and their families from year zero. Uh, the whole system ought to be focused on intervening earlier uh, and avoiding over pathologizing uh, where possible. We also, I think, have to confront the continuing horror of what happens to too many young people when they reach 18 and they're told that all of the support mechanism that is in place for them is to be removed and that they have to take their chances uh, under adult services. Uh, when I published Future in Mind as the minister in 2015, we said that the transition, hard transition at 18 should end. Uh, seven, eight years on, it's still routinely in place across the country, which I find quite uh, extraordinary. But I want to now focus on listening to our experts. So we're gonna be hearing from them in a panel discussion, and we'll hear more about the approach that their organization takes to support uh, children's mental health and how this uh, supports positive outcomes and what they think needs to change going forward. There will also be some time you to put your questions to our panelists 
in a Q&A se session at the end, uh, which Charlotte Rayner uh, will be uh, in charge of as I have to leave before the end of the session to uh, do take part in another virtual session. Uh, this will be um, uh, Charlotte. Charlotte's role is as coalition lead for the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition. And I've enjoyed very much working with Charlotte over the last uh, few years. Please do add your question to the chat when it is open. Uh, so without uh, waiting any longer, I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. First of all, we have Lucy Stevens, director at the New School. And I had the enormous pleasure of visiting the New School for the first time on Tuesday of this week and was in, immensely impressed by what I saw and heard. Uh, we then have Emily Smith, uh, Creative Community Resettlement Lead, uh, joined by Kane Salthouse, comedian and young person, both from Odd Arts. Next, we have uh, Sandra Harrison, Chief Executive of Youth Access, then Chelsea Gardner, Principal Clinical Psychologist, Lecturer and Project Future Consultant, uh, and finally, Zainab Zahawan, uh, lived experience consultant and founder of Emotion Dysregulation in Autism Charity. So welcome to all of the panel. Um, now, we've got three questions that I'm going to put to the panel um, in turn. And we're going to have some succinct, punchy answers from all of them, I'm sure. Uh, so that we have time at the end for opening it up for a Q&A. So the first question I want to put to the panel is, how is your approach supporting children and young people's mental health? And if I could come to you first, uh, Lucy. Thanks, Norman. Um, so yeah, at the new school, we're pioneering a new approach to mainstream education. So outside of the straight jacket of rigid accountability structures, such as standardized academic testing, which can skew sort of teaching and learning to the test. And in doing so determines how time can be used in the school, which often means a lowering of priority on pastoral practice. So for us, we focus on giving young people a really strong sense of uh, uh, personal agency, uh, the will and ability to positively influence their own lives and the world around them, um, predicated on the belief that building intrinsic motivation for behaviour and for learning and for their own lives has a hugely positive impact on well-being. Um, so we value relationships and belonging. Uh, we're strong on accountability and care. Um, and we approach behaviour as communication and as a product of the context in which young people find themselves. Um, and so when young people act in ways that cause harm or transgress agreed boundaries, we hold them accountable in a way that pulls them in rather than excludes them. Um, and so in using this approach to community accountability, our aim is to encourage collective responsibility, uncover the wider issues surrounding harm and uh, support young people to work through their emotional responses and understand how to set their own and respect others' boundaries. And so we use our impact in our research to demonstrate that if you can change the way we hold schools accountable and the structures of schools, you impact young people's well-being and to make a financial argument about the savings when you focus on well-being, um, engagement in learning, preventing needs, preventing harm to young people's mental health, which all come at a personal and economic cost. So good to see an approach that is a bit more sophisticated in responding to behaviour. Uh, than the normal one, which uh, seeks to punish without understanding uh, why that behaviour is, is happening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lucy. Can we now move to Emily and to Kane, the, the famous double act? <laughs> Hi, y'all. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, at Odd Arts and with Creative Community Resettlement, uh, we work with people on a flexible basis and we really try and meet people where they are and uh, see the person for the person and what is happening for them um, and really try to kind of address the need for what it is that they, they want and aspire to do creatively. Um, we don't always sort of go in with, people don't always have a creative 
thing that they want to do but we you know we try and build confidence and resilience through theatre writing film whatever it is that um that person might show an interest in um and we really try and sort of create a, a safe space for them to come weekly or as as often as they would like to and give them a, a place to play and feel that they can share and um, explore their mental health um through through that and um, so i'm going to pass on to kay now who's going to tell you a little bit about what he does with us if that's okay Hi, uh, my name is Kane Solar Owls, um, I'm 21 years of age. Uh, I also have autism. So what all that's do with me is uh, he uh, helped me to build up confidence and resilience, at, like she said, than that, with like, because I won't be a comedian. And uh, we do like sessions where we do like strategies to build up like confidence and to build up skills of developing comedy material because with comedy it brings up it's a natural and it's it's like a cure for sadness and mental health because it helps people and that get through in life because laughter is the key that's my thing I love doing comedy and it also helped me to I also performed that for Frog and Bucket in Manchester which was amazing performance if it wasn't for the staffing up at all that, I would have been in the same position how I am now. Thank you. Fantastic. You're all being incredibly disciplined on timing, so I very much appreciate it. It's making my job a little bit easier as chair, so thank you. Uh, next, uh, Cassie. Cassie Harrison from uh, Youth Access. Over to you. Um, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so at Youth Access, we are the national membership network for um, local community-based open access youth advice and support services for young people aged 11 to 25, also sometimes known as early support hubs. And I can see from the chat that we have a couple of our fantastic members here, Centre 33 and off the record Bristol, which is lovely. Um, so our approach and our members, um, they support young people with mental ill health through counselling, um, but also really recognise that our mental health doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? There are loads of other things going on in our lives that affect it and can be affected by it. Um, and, you know, as Norman was saying earlier, we know that young people want to be treated as more than just a diagnosis. They want what your, one young person described to us as whole life support. So as well as counselling, they provide advice and practical support on many of the kind of social and legal issues that might interact, uh, that might, young people might be facing, whether that's housing, homelessness, um, debt, um, advice around kind of employment. So a real um, kind of integrated and holistic support for young people with whatever they've got going on in their lives. We know that it's effective in terms of clinical outcomes and reducing psychological distress. Um, young people report higher satisfaction um, compared to kind of CAMS and schools based counselling. Um, it reaches a slightly different cohort of young people, so reaches young people from groups who might be quite poorly served by some of the statutory and mainstream services. It provides a a bridge rather than a cliff edge at age 18 by going up to age 25. And I, most importantly, it's what young people tell us that they want. Brilliant, Cassie. And it's such an enlightened uh, approach and not narrowly looking at mental health, but understanding all of the uh, complex issues that young people are having to deal with, which may well affect their mental health and their well-being. So thank you so much uh, for that description. Next, a uh, warm welcome to you, Chelsea. Hi everybody, um, I'm Chelsea and I'm going to talk a bit about kind of project future and similarly in terms of youth access about how we approach a mental health service and basically we're, we are a co-produced mental health service and so co-produced with the communities that we work with, both the young people but the services um, that we support and really we're a community psychology informed service so that means similarly to youth access we're looking at the variety of factors that might influence young people's mental health and cycles of offending specifically. So not just about the individual, but educational, racial inequality, housing, et cetera. But we come from that position to think about, well, how do we provide holistic intervention or support 
across these levels. So not just working with an individual or with a family, but also with the systems around them to think about the care and support that they provide. So it might look like traditional, if we quote unquote, working with young people in therapy, but with families, education, employment support, but also working it with police, schools, the council, NHS, both directly with the young people working with, but providing consultation, supervision, learning, to really think about how we perceive young people who are underserved, who are deemed as um, gang affiliated, to think about the care and the unmet need. And I think for us, we really focus on actually how do we build the trust with the community which we work in, the young people, um, as well as the staff, how are we valuing the community expertise so we can genuinely co-produce what we do on a weekly basis, but also the social action projects we might feed back into the council or kind of our government and system more widely. But I think secondly, as a system, we're really thinking about, you know, as a psychologist and the multiple NDT, how do we own our expertise, but we're not an expert in young people's lives. So how do we stretch, adjust, adapt how we work to make things accessible and acceptable in terms of the provision we provide? And really, what are the systems that hold us accountable? Because we are part of the system. We are part of the wider structural inequalities. How do I hold supervision? What are the team spaces? How are we coming together to think, to really hold ourselves accountable to the values which we wish to uphold? How do we make the tensions transparent to think about next steps rather than saying, oh, we're doing better, so we'll just keep doing the same thing. But how do we evolve and bring that kind of community voice and really try to centre and honour the expertise of the young people we work with? Again, beautifully succinct. Uh, Chelsea, which part of the country <clears throat> are you actually working in? Working in. So we're in Haringey, so North London, Tottenham uh, specifically. Brilliant. Uh, and you highlighted really importantly the uh, disproportionate impact on some young people, some parts of our community, uh, both in terms of um, poverty, but also uh, uh, the race dimension to this that we need to confront as well as other inequalities that also uh, exist so really uh, helpful uh, and it sounds immensely impressive uh, and finally last but not least uh, Zainab over to you Hey, great stuff. Thank you very much, Norman. Lovely to hear from all the other panellists. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm ZZ or Zainab. Um, I prefer ZZ. Um, I'm from Emotion Dysregulation and Autism, of which I'm founder of. So Emotion Dysregulation and Autism is a youth mental health charity for autistic young people leaving the psychiatric inpatient system. Um, so we provide two major things. So one is um, peer support. So we're currently fundraising, but hoping to launch in September of 2024, um, sorry, 2023. Um, and um, that's where we um, deliver um, a psychological model so it would be dialectical behavioral therapy for autistics um, as well as a typical peer support um, relationship so our kind of main um, premise that we're basing all of this on uh, um, is that um, resilience isn't something that you have or don't have it's something that can be learned and usually when it comes to therapy um, there's a lot of um, people usually just think of it as um, like kind of opening up a can of worms and kind of going through into deep trauma. But actually the, the first step in therapy is creating that foundation to your kind of house or your building, which is um, kind of skills. So um, in our peer support service, we're going to be um, delivering um, kind of emotion regulation skills, distress tolerance skills, um, to be able to teach young people how to um, be able to manage their emotions safely and effectively. Um, so that would be um, by young people for young people with lived experience um, so that's our um, kind of peer support service um, our other service that we um, provide is social action workshops so we recently got funded by the university of birmingham to deliver a social action workshop where we um, co-produce a training package with young people who are from marginalized or underserved communities which is kind of um kind of being BAME and autistic and the kind of link between that and um uh um, creating a training package to police settings and children in um children's residential homes um and all of this is kind of born from lived experience so I myself um, am autistic and struggled in psychiatric inpatient services for a duration of four years and that's why I set up the charity with my trustee board so yeah, that's a little introduction about the work that I'm doing with um, youth mental health. Well, how dynamic is that? Uh, massive admiration for what you've achieved, what you're doing. Uh, so uh, thank you, Zainab, uh, for that uh, contribution. 
Next, uh, we should move on to uh, the following question. How should an effective mental health system address issues around inequalities? We've already touched on it uh, and marginalized groups, including LGBTQA plus and racialized communities. Um, now, perhaps I can come to uh, Chelsea first and then to Zainab and I, if we've got time, I'll bring in others as well. Thank you, Norman. I'll try and be succinct so we can bring in some others. And I guess I'm holding in mind what we've done at Project Future, but my other hat um, in terms of the work that I do about addressing inequalities in other um, services. And I guess a few things come to mind are thinking, you know, there is wider research in inequalities, but I think services should be thinking about how do they embed audits or reports in relation to their service or their borough really to think about well actually what might be our gaps and our needs and that should be an ongoing thing not oh we did it six years ago and this is what we found but how is that continual and then I think it's twofold I feel like services has often then said oh so this community this racialized community or in terms of other difference they're not accessing our service so let's reach out but we're often locating the difficulty or the problem or the barriers in the community, whether it's labels as hard to reach or let's reach out to um, a religious organization, let's reach out to this other organization. And I think that's an important part of it, but it's not just leaving that there. One, how are we looking at our own systems? How are we providing training? Yeah. How are we thinking about the structures and the team spaces so we can continually think about our wait and listen, our policies, how do we keep accountable in our supervision? What might we be doing in-house that might be affecting this and how could we change that? But also when we're reaching out community, I think it's like, how do we develop that relationship on a basis of respect and building that trust? And actually how do we sustain <clears throat> those relationships to think about co-produced ideas or to think about, okay, let's try this, let's try doing a group, for example, in a particular, with a particular partner organization. But how do we sustain that? I think often what we do is reach out, do a consultation, take a few points, and then they sometimes sit collecting dust or we do one action, but we don't feed that back. So there isn't this um, uh, transparent loop or cycle of like, oh, this is what we've changed. How do we continually build on that? And so for me, it's about how do we sustain some of these factors? Because it isn't just a one size fits all or a one action is going to change the, these inequalities. And it is embedded in, you know, our systems, our structures. So how do we see that as part of our work ongoing uh, in our service from evaluation, building and sustaining partnerships, but also looking at our own systems, our own practices, our own assumptions, how do we yep. provide uh, spaces to think about our own assumptions or to challenge those of what those look like in our work or um, how we, I guess, hold that accountability as a team or um, internally. So those are a few of uh, the kind of, I guess, umbrella ideas that might look different in different teams, but those I think are kind of the three you know, three kind of themes or umbrellas um, that we should be holding in mind with a strong sense of sustainability, not a one-off workshop or a, a one-off intervention, but how do we continue this as part of our practice uh, as much as you might do a zoning meeting in the morning or write a note <laughs> on a system um, in that way. Thank you, Chelsea. I, I'm very struck as chair of the South London Maudsley, the level of mistrust yeah. of statutory services uh, by particularly the black community. Um, and I was completely blown away in Lewisham a couple of weeks ago doing a sort of tour of black led community organizations and this extraordinary civic society that hitherto we've largely ignored, but we should be collaborating with them, uh, breaking down those barriers um, and treating them as equal partners, it seems to me. Um, uh, let's bring in Zainab uh, for your uh, thoughts on this. Yeah, definitely. So I, I, I definitely agree with what Chelsea said about how often it's it's not that those communities are hard to reach. It's just that statutory services find them easy to ignore. Yes. Um, and, um, Good point. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so with um, marginalised communities, um, particularly the kind of BAME um, kind of um, 
demographic there's a lot of um a lack of understanding there's that there needs to be um i was talking with nhs england about this about creating a cultural competency framework and understanding visibility in in access to mental health services and understanding um kind of cultural sensitivity and the difference between that and cultural competency um but with, with children and young people in BAME communities, there's often a lot of mistrust um, in, yeah. in statutory services. So I'll give an example. So um, in my lived experience, my um, parents didn't quite understand my autism or my mental health problems. And so went down the road of going through exorcisms and stuff, which is quite common in South Asian communities. Um, but it's something that is um, quite normalised in South, South Asian communities, but um, thought of as really radical and shocking in um, kind of kind of the majority of the white community. Um, and I think there needs to be some sort of building bridges and outreach work done with with marginalised BAME communities. Um, so with uh, with my charity, we kind of work with um, places of worship and we, we do outreach work where we talk yeah. about um, youth mental health and have these transformative conversations about um, the kind of westernised view of, of mental illness um, as opposed to kind of non-westernised views. Um, and I think reaching out and kind of making those um, bridges, those links with local communities is what is going to um, bring a sense of unity in in understanding and treatment of um, mental ill health within within young people. I agree with every word you said there, Zainab. <clears throat> I visited a couple of weeks ago a, a brilliant uh, uh, service in southwest London where uh, they're working with community, training up imams and priests to give them a better understanding of mental health issues not to make the mental health professionals but just to understand better so that they can in turn support people more effectively uh let's bring in lucy and then cassie i think you might also have something to say and, it, it, and if um emily and kana also want to contribute that's fine by me so lucy first Thank you. Um, yeah, so for at the new school, for us, an effective mental health system that supports communities with protected characteristics starts with early intervention in schools and inter institutions and systems. But we have to consciously build an inclusive culture that values young people's and staff's complex identities and ancestries. Um, and so for us, this is um, then how we can then support the well-being and autonomy and valuing of lived experience, which is so crucial. Um, and I think it's so important that institutions and particularly schools, because that's where our experience is, actively interrogate and reject the idea that young people and staff have to fit a certain profile to be included. And recognizing that so many school practice is inherently discrimin discriminatory because of that very typical one size fits all practice, which is often determined by those that have already got privileged identities. Um, and I think often changing policies um, can often be performative, as Chelsea said, but without taking a deep look at the structures and practice. And it's everything from behavior policies to learning and curriculum um, and making the space so that those with lived experience have got the central voice in the cultural change that needs to happen within institutions. Um, and, you know, true inclusive practice eliminates barriers to learning, to behavior, you know, to, to access um, and and advocating for the needs and, um, of young people and staff who are historically marginalized by ableism or classism, homophobia, racism or any other forms of systemic oppression. Um, and for us, that's rooted in culture and education um in our non-punitive approach where we're really trying to understand one another accepting um you know difference and understanding kind of where we sit in a more privileged privileged position so schools have a crucial role in this for me thank you and i remember when i visited you um i made the comment that your approach seemed to be the polar opposite of a one-size-fits-all type of approach where you actually look at each human being in their own right, which is, uh, I found, very attractive. Uh, Cassie, let's bring you in. Um, thank you. I mean, they've been really comprehensive, uh, great answers so far, so I will keep it very brief. But I guess, you know, we really we need to recognise that, you know, discrimination and inequality are really pervasive in all of our systems and services, including our own, I think, which Chelsea said earlier, and we need to have those uh, uncomfortable conversations and take responsibility and make sure accountability is in place. Um, 
And I think ultimately, you know, meaningful co-production um, is, is what's needed in a way which shares power with people from those communities. And then just very qu quickly to finish, one thing that I, I thought was worth reflecting on is that, you know, we do, which I think has been touched on, that we, we have a very Western white centric approach to mental yeah. health, which is very individualistic and which centers, um, you know, it ignores the collective nature of oppression and focuses, which then ends up focusing on young people's behaviours rather than, you know, those those symptoms of that discrimination and oppression that they're experiencing. And I also think kind of social action then also has a really important role to play there as well. Uh, very thoughtful. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Cassie. Uh, Emily and Kay, do you want to come in add, to add anything? Yeah, I think Kay and um, I think everyone's sort of said things that I would have said, but Kane's quite, and um, would like to share something if that's all right with everybody. Yeah, so what I want to say is, uh, you know, like with people, like with learning difficulties and mental health, because, you know, the system at the moment with uh, mental health and people in crisis and that, because mm -hmm. I've got learning difficulty and we also suffer with depression and uh, I go through intrusive thoughts and I, I worry couple years last year I was in a bad place but I wasn't getting seen too quick I wasn't getting sorted because it would putting me on a uh, waiting list so the waiting list is longer that's what I disagree with it's because uh, no wiggy system with mental health is um, good because uh, you don't take it consideration for people you say when well, I've been to rainy dozens of times and I've been in a waiting list where I've been waiting for hours to see a psychologist or uh, someone to speak with and you know it's you just send you home and you don't want to take it consideration so it makes me feel stressed and that and with mental health it isn't it isn't treatable how it should be treatable because and uh, you keep saying it's you earn your difficulties but it's not it's your mental health because people do you know when and you also don't take self-harming very far as well you just say well we put a bandage on you and send you home so yeah uh, i think uh, it needs to be better where we need to start getting things done right now, not waiting, just get it done. And where people give you like telephone appointments where they want you to speak with like uh, Samaritans and that, to me, I don't think it's good enough because you need someone there for them, like in that specific time where you're having a midnight crisis, where you're in trauma and you're in worry, worry, worry crisis because yesterday I was a bit depressed and that, but sometimes get just so yeah thank you thank you zane you zane and zainab are sort of living proof of the failures of our current uh, system and it's brilliant to have your input into this discussion both of you so uh, thank you uh, so much so let's now move on to uh, the final question of this uh, section of the um, of, of the uh, session um, and the question is this, uh, and I'll put it to every member of the pan panel. If you had to choose one action, it's an impossible question, incidentally, but if you had to choose one action to help build an effective system uh, for children's mental health, uh, what would it be? Uh, so let's go uh, again to uh, Lucy to start with. Okay, uh, just the one. Um, just, okay, the one. So just the one. Just the one. For us, it would <laughs> actually be aligning the integrated care board strategy across across the country with schools and education policy. Yeah. I think we have them completely separate at the moment, but taking that preventative early intervention approach to wellness. Um, I think IC, uh, ICBs have weight that can support change across the wider range of institutions. Um, and the crucial aspect, though, is not to, uh, and I said this to you the other day, uh, Norman, didn't I, but not to rely only on evidence based solutions that are usually determined through uh, randomized control trials. Uh, system change work has to be rooted in quality, uh, qualitative work that's not simply what works and a quick strategy to add on to existing structural problems. 
Um, and we need more funding pots that enable innovation, pilots, whole school approaches to inclusion and well-being if we're going to change the status quo and support young people to develop the skills that they need for future lives. Um, for us, there's no point children leaving school with just numbers on a piece of paper and no skills of actually how to learn or skills to manage sort of social emotional difficulties. You know, that's not compatible with sort of life satisfaction and the ability to thrive in later life. Um, and we also need to hold schools accountable to a broader range of metrics and not simply academic results. Lucy, that was a very, very smart way of trying of answering a question to give one. <laughs> <laughs> you cheeky <laughs> so <laughs> uh, Just picking up on your point about research, it's a really good point that, you know, we, we laud the importance of randomised control trials as you know, a, a, a strong uh, basis for uh, doing research. And yet there is a real risk that it crushes innovation and we should uh, always allow and enable and encourage uh, innovation of the sort that you're doing. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, let me now bring in Emily and Zane. Kane. It's Kane. It's Kane. <laughs> um, no, sorry, Kane. I do apologize. <laughs> um, sorry, Kane. Yeah, oh, Kate, um, so um, I mine would be to, for um, people and organisations, schools, colleges to be more open to creative approaches in supporting mental health. Um, we had some medical students on placement with us a few weeks ago, some GPs that are about to qualify and they had no idea about the things that we were doing in Manchester. And um, one of them was going out with a psychologist who had no idea that these things were available to people as a, as a support. Um, you know, we see such a massive progress in you know even a week-long program of, of um, working creatively and having the chance to explore mental health and talk about things in a different way where people may have been usually sort of asked to speak about it in a camp setting or in a setting where they feel on the spot and that this is you know all about them whereas you know taking the, the pressure off that in that way that they have to speak about their feelings you know as as them themselves they can be creative about it and think of different ways that they might be able to express that. And I think being open minded to different creative approaches within different settings would be my my thing. Okay. So um, my question would be is uh, learning disabilities. It needs to be more recognizable and more like understandable because in society at the moment, I know people what don't understand disability where you think, all this person's a bit thingy, a bit, 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 bit dodgy and stuff like that. And it makes you feel like, and that's where mental health comes in because disability can trigger mental health off with uh, suicide thoughts and uh, thoughts of self-harming, which, and you know, it's it needs to be more treatable and more respectful where you need to understand where people are coming from and not resilient and just sort of throwing them back and that to square one because we're, we're people. That's why you need to get better with it. Brilliant. Kane and Emily, thank you so much. And apologies again. Um, uh, great uh, and enlightened approach you've just uh, offered to us. Uh, next, let's bring in Cassie. Um, uh, it's perhaps unsurprising people that know me to hear me say this, but I would want all young people to be able to access um, free local community based um, advice and uh, counselling services that uh, don't have thresholds. Young people don't get told they're not sick enough to get help um, and the services that um, respect young people's rights and meet their individual needs. Essentially, I would like implementation of what was in future in mind many years ago, please. Thank you. You know how to please me. That's uh, <laughs> a very attractive way of putting it. But uh, I think we're slowly building here uh, the hallmarks of a brilliant new approach to children and young people's mental health needs. So thank you for that, Cassie. Uh, Chelsea, next. I would, I'm choosing one, thinking about uh, what we've done at Project Future. And but think, do stretch it a bit, Chelsea. Stretch it, Lucy yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> noted, noted. <laughs> um, I guess, and holding a kind of psychologist in mind, if that's my profession, I would really think and want uh, to think about how we join systems and capture that work. 
because often and how do we join systems like the project I focus on was on a youth club uh, children's centers um, those community spaces where I think say for example young people how they exist in a youth club is very different from school they have a different relationship to be a young person an adult and their identity so they can challenge in a different way they're going there because they choose to and so that puts professionals if we quote unquote on a different uh, standing point where you have to really think about well actually how can I challenge myself to make this accessible and acceptable how do I apply or use my expertise versus Hi, I'm a psychologist, send somebody to a room. We're supposed to sit and do one-to-one. -one. So really what I'd like is thinking about how do psychologists actually join a system to get to know that system and think about how can our expertise or how can my knowledge be adapted and applied to that system? So it's not just one-to-one -one direct work, but how are we thinking about the system's supervision of the staff's staff well-being, staff training and teaching? A lot, a lot of times when I'm in the youth club, I'm thinking about anxiety and well-being um, and low mood. But hold it in mind, OK, if I'm doing training for the youth staff, how do I do training that's applicable to the open access sessions they run? Not my jargon and my language over here. So then they need how many other weeks to think about how do I apply this? In my work but really how do I adapt and make my uh, make psychology accessible how do I share it in a way that then supports that system to support even more young people because I'm under no illusion there's a limited number of psychologists and I'm there part-time so I'm not going to see all the young people <laughs> so how do we join systems how do I uh, how do I make myself of use in the system that we join and that rather than saying I'm a psychologist here, come and see me for this one-to-one. -one. And so I'd really want to challenge us as a profession, which we're doing now, trying to train more staff to then do this one-to-one -one hidden in another corridor, whether it's a school or a youth club, but really to join a system and think about, well, what does it mean to apply my knowledge in this kind of current setting? And similarly to um, what Cass was saying about how do we capture that? In Project Future, we think about the quantitative measures. We know systems want that, qualitative aspects, but also similarly in terms of like Odd Arts and Kate and Emily, what is the creative aspect that usually comes out of the young people we're working with? So we've done exhibitions of, on housing, we've created films um, and we've created animations that have come out of the young people's ideas about how we capture the work that we do or how we do social action back into the, um, into the kind of the council or the community that we work with. So all of that is really thinking about, you know, yeah. we apply our expertise in a different way um, in terms of, OK, how do we navigate the system? But how do we provide something uh, new and innovative in that way? So it would really be about challenging how we join systems versus we're the expert. This is what I do kind of hidden in, in a room, if that makes sense. And that's, brilliant. That. That, that's brilliant, Chelsea. And you've got so much power to sort of upskill um, workforces you know whether it's in youth clubs or schools so that places are psychologically informed in the way that they uh, support uh, young people uh, really interesting thank you for that and then finally Zainab uh, look forward to hearing from you yeah so um I, before I start I just wanted to say um um add to what kind of Kane was saying about the need for um the autism need so there's a statistic that says that um I think it's um autistics are 28 times more likely to consider suicide and in the west midlands cams provide a collaborative the um number of inpatients that were autistic it was something like 57 percent of all inpatients were autistic so there's a clear need um and going on to um my kind of answer to the question um so there's two things that i'd want to implement so one is a system that is multi-dimensional and second is a system that is trauma informed so for the multi-dimensional aspect the the state of mental health services at the moment is complex and Le like multi-layered so we need a multi-layered approach in being able to tackle that problem um and i really feel that cams just needs needs to be scrapped and start again because of of how much harm has been done um but i also think that um there's a, uh, the way that i think the future is going is working with schools working with places of worship uh, working with youth workers working with um um, kind of inpatient services, statutory services, primary care, GPs, um, to create mentally healthy, a mentally healthy country. Um, I think that um, 
you know we're so used to going to the GP for um for kind of physical health problems and I think that um one day I'd like to and we get PSHE at, at, in schools kind of like talking about um different aspects of health and um how to like you know the importance of exercise and things like that but really we need more mental health education in in um, all settings where young people are involved um, so I think we need um, a multidisciplinary approach to that which encompasses um, psychologically informed um, methods too so that's the multi-dimensional aspect the second part is being trauma informed so there's um, been a lot of harm that's happened to um, young people over the years um, you know we've heard from you know a while ago the Winterbourne View scandal and then the Panorama quite recently um, and um, I think a system would the, the system would do well to acknowledge the systemic trauma that's been caused over the years but um, whilst acknowledging that trauma also holding um, as well that kind of ability to foster hope and to restore trust between young people and statutory services um so one particular example would be that um so when i was kind of traumatized and um sectioned for four years and you know in restraint you know for hours at a time um on the floor like they gave me this diagnosis of personality disorder and they were calling me they were saying my personality was disordered when actually i was just really traumatized and how is that compassionate how is that empathetic um so i think assist the system would do well to um hold themselves accountable for the trauma that's been caused but also to um work towards a system that encourages hope and um the ability to transform young people's lives in in um birmingham we currently have not to 25 year old services and it really changed my life and um it, it really helped stop me from being an inpatient in, in yep, adult services absolutely. and they used to say when i um spoke to adults who were in um, adult mental health services I felt a strong sense of, um, I don't know, discomfort because they were so old and like their life was done. But with young people, we have the power to intervene early to prevent later um, mental health problems. And you have that hope to make sure that you you don't go on for the rest of your life to have mental health problems. You can stop it now. Um, and so, um, yeah, I want, I want a system that is is hopeful and empowering to young people. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer to the question. Fantastic, Zayda. Uh, and it's interesting the point you make about the proportion of people in inpatient care who are autistic. And uh, I've uh, dealt with specific individuals, um, particularly when I was minister, where uh, clearly being an inpatient and being autistic uh, was particularly uh, traumatic uh, for, for them uh, in an alien environment. And, you know, this country is an outlier internationally for how long we keep people in inpatient care. We spend far too much of our uh, children and young people's mental health budget on effectively containment of people in uh, settings that are rarely therapeutic uh, and that often re-traumatise young people. So we, we both need more money spent on children and young people at the prevention and early intervention end, uh, but we also need to use the money differently and move away from institutionalised care uh, in order to uh, find extra money to invest in all of the things that you have talked about today. Uh, and I can say at the end of this um, uh, panel discussion that I'm, a f I'm formally appointing all six of you to be in charge of designing the new system for children and young people's mental health in this country. Uh, you start tomorrow, incidentally, uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Chelsea Emily Kane uh, Zainab, Lucy and Cassie uh, for a brilliant and enlightened discussion. I have to leave now. I've completed my assignment, but I hand over to Charlotte Rayner. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Thank you so much, Norman. Um, as Norman introduced earlier, my name's Charlotte Rayner and I'm coalition lead at the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition and we're hosted by Centre for Mental Health. Um, thank you so much to all the panellists for all your discussion. I so enjoyed listening to you all and it gave me hope about all the work that you're doing. Um, we have a pre-submitted question that I would like to come to first. Um, the chat is now open for you to add your questions, but I wanted to stick on the theme of empowering young people, which Zizi, you mentioned in your um, kind of closing remarks. We've had a question about co-production. So 
what does authentic co-production with children and young people look like and how much um, co-production should organisations aspire to do with young people? Um, so does anyone want to come in and answer that question? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so I think co-production to me means um, the ability to share power and to um, hold um, the two views of kind of lived experience working, but also um, kind of clinical research working, um, but being able to marry the two together and kind of um, being able to share power together and um, have an equal partnership in um, kind of working together to to kind of make services better. So I feel that co-production has a place in children and young people's mental health within research um, and service design, service delivery, um, public mental health initiatives. Um, and I think that um, the kind of gold star would be to kind of empower young people in those um, types of roles in terms of transformation, service design, research, being able to empower young people to um, help them to understand that actually lived experience is just as um, valuable as kind of clinical experience, that lived experience, that um, experience that has made you an expert um, is just as valid as um, the experiences that a clinician or a researcher may have because you bring a different um, perspective. Um, so yeah, I feel like um, within research, I think I'd love to see more um, kind of peer researchers or lived experience researchers within the youth mental health space kind of um, work with um, mental health services in, in like kind of academic uh, uh, psychiatry. Um, I also think um, things around service design and transformation. So with the new um, provider collaborative models where experts by experience are, um, are within each provider collaborative in the region, I feel like, um, it's isn't the model for co-production that NHS is using at the moment isn't sustainable um, and can be a lot better. So um, I, I think that there's definitely room for non-tokenistic, completely meaningful, genuine co-production and, and not faux production. That's why I call it if it's not um, genuine faux production. Um, so yeah, that's I think I think um, it comes down to um, sharing power, empowering young people, um, and um, being able to foster lived experience in a more authentic way. Brilliant. I love that, Zizi, faux production. Thank you so much. Um, before I go to the next panellist to answer, um, can I just ask as a reminder to everyone or the participants today, if you could put your questions in the chat and we'll come to them in the chat, that would be really appreciated. Um, thank you. Lucy, I saw you took yourself off mute. So did you want to come in? <laughs> I did. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good question because I think um, for, for us, at the new school, it really depends on how much space and time you can create in the education system to develop the space to build those intrinsic, the intrinsic motivation that's needed to co-produce outcomes with young people. Um, and we often talk about sort of self-determination theory, which says there's three things that we need in life, autonomy, relatedness and competence. And they have to be actively cultivated in, a, in the school culture because it's the foundation of co-production for us. Um, so although we're a non-fee paying school, we don't have fees, we're actually a private school by status. And that gives us a lot more freedom to plan our time and to make space in the school day um, for this because there's a lot of work that goes into co-production in terms of skill building. Um, so we have minimum 20% of the school day is for self-directed time where young people work on their own projects and goals. And we have time where we're also picking up pastoral um, needs and, and working that way. Um, and what we're doing as teachers in that space and the staff is, is scaffolding those processes. So some, some young people are off and they're fine and others need a lot more scaffolding and particularly around executive function. So self-regulation, staying on task, planning, organizing time, which are the key skills for life for, for, for our perspective. So for us, it's crucial that we make the time around co-production and self-direction and, and those skills. Um, but it is a challenge having come from mainstream school in myself to find the time when you are being held account to something different. Thank you, Lucy. Um, did anyone else want to come in and answer the co-production question before we move on to our next one? If you do, Chris, Kelsey. <laughs> 
I guess I was just thinking of two quick things because uh, Project Future is a co-produced service, but similarly, uh, Lucy was saying that there is a time and different remits, but I do think actually there is a space to aspire to that you can co-produce whatever your remit is. It's then, then thinking, well, actually within the confines that I do, how do we set up that space? And sometimes remembering, actually, how do you, young people have opinions, they have thoughts, they do have uh, opinions to share. How do we create that space? But how do we also unpick, okay, as adults, or this is what the system wants, how do we unpick our own assumptions to then be able to, well, how are we creating space to share power? What does it mean to share power? What does it mean to build trust for young people to be able to answer a question or to do a workshop with you based on play, to respond, to be able to get that feedback versus, Okay, we are adults or professionals, we want to ask you this question, you now have to <laughs> give it back to us in that way. But also for me, what's also key about co-production is that cyclical process of action. Because a lot of time if we work with young people who um, may be in the criminal justice system, the amount of time various systems email us, we want to do a talk with young people about what are the factors that impact crime and how we can support or how we can change. And after six years, they're like, we've done that uh, space uh, we are known now as Project Future, maybe when we, in our early days, we were thinking that's about building relationships, but then we're like, we're not doing that space anymore. <laughs> How do you respond to what you did with the information we've given over the last few years for what is out there? And how do you feed that back to the young people you're co-producing with to move back on versus we're collating your expertise and then it goes into EFA somehow and there's no direct change or even re the respect to feed that back. And that is then how the trust builds or you're thinking about sustainability and accountability for change. But I think there are ways to create spaces, even if it's like, I want to be back on the questionnaire I'm developing for a group. There is ways, or if you come to co-production with that idea about valuing expertise but to create that, Versus, you know, if I've got money and I can totally co-produce a service from the ground up and the flexibility, it's not one or the other, but it is that mindset about, well, actually, how are we creating space to have exactly as easy says, I say, genuine co-production versus the tick box. And how do we, um, yeah, value them as human beings that have opinions that will teach us a lot <laughs> and that should challenge us and keep us on, on our toes and thinking. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And you're so right. It's that transparency and how do we always feed back and make sure that we're showcasing to young people that we're what we're doing with what they're with what they're telling us. Um, Emily and Kane, I'm cautious you have to leave shortly. So I just didn't know if you wanted to add anything to that co-production point. Um, but no pressure. If not, I just wanted to give you the opportunity before you leave and to recognise your contributions to today's session. Um I think we're good. No, that's fine. We okay. we were just I was just going to say on co-production in terms of when we work with young people, we always think about um, the restorative window and working with people and sort of like meeting people there. Yeah. And it's always like with not for or two. And um, be more equal with each other and stuff like if you because you got a disability or if you got like uh, if you got a LGBTQ, I can't say it, sorry, because I've got speech impairment and stuff and um, and this you can also need to get better with dyslexia as well where it needs to be more culpable with it where because you need to get taught how to read and write where people can help you process with it so you know yeah yeah that's great thank you so much. oh well thank you so much emily and kane for joining us for today's session kane you've been fantastic so thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us and really privileged that you could be with us today so thank you so much you. it's been a pleasure thank you everyone <laughs> thank you guys um so we've got a couple more pre-submitted questions um, that I'd like to ask you guys if that's okay. Um, I also just want to recognise some of the comments that are coming through in the chat, just talking about what brilliant um, panellists you've all been and the contributions you've given today. Um, so assuming this isn't just a UK situation, assuming um, that there are other countries kind of grappling with what we're grappling with at the moment, are any of you aware of like what other countries are doing that are kind of innovative and helpful, um, particularly around like mental health services and waiting lists? Um, Patty, I might come to you first for this one, just because I know through your work, you're kind of aware of some other models like the Headspace and um, Jigsaw model, if you want to talk about those. And then Zizi, I'll come to you next. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, I don't, when I saw this question, I was like, no, I should, should probably know a better, <laughs> better answer to this. Um, yeah, so there are other, um, I mean, obviously we're coming at it from a particular angle in, type, in terms of the type of model that, we're, that our members are delivering. But there is, um, so there's a similar model uh, which gets talked about quite a lot in Australia called Headspace. Um, and actually they came to the UK to learn about what we were doing and then they, and everyone's like, oh, Headspace in Australia. It's like, well, they, you know, they did, let, they did take something from us. Um, but I think what's really important, there are some differences in some parts of it that, you know, we think maybe wouldn't necessarily translate here. So for example, we, they have like a national branded, it's a Headspace, it's a common kind of like, everyone knows it's a, it's a Headspace. Whereas our view is actually for, for young people, it's really important that they are engaging with, um, you know, uh, services that have been that have been in their local communities often for a long time. There's a lot of trust built there. And actually, a lot of reason they find them more accessible is because they're not stigmatised by being called a mental health service or being part of, you know, a, a, like a government kind of funded system. However, the things that are really useful, I think, is that actually they have consistent national funding to make sure that services are available which is which is important um uh, and we would very much like to see here thank you Cathy and apologies for putting you on the spot there as well with that question that's right don't worry <laughs> um it's easy I'll come to you next yeah, so um, I, I know about Headspace too, so I, I, I think it was in September I went to the International Association for Youth Mental Health um, that was in Copenhagen, but it was hosted by um, kind of Origin Global, which is the kind of wider part of like, the kind of research um, global part of, of Headspace. Um, and so um, I spoke to a um, psychiatrist from Hong Kong there, and he had some really interesting insights about how, because he, he had worked kind of internationally in different mental health services and he had some really interesting insights so he said that when when young people that were under his care um had to had to go into inpatient or needed inpatient they'd have the same team so if you were in the community you'd have the same team from as soon as you were seen by a clinician up until the end of your kind of discharge so even if somebody went to um a different part of the service so like needed kind of eating disorder services or like a dietitian or neuropsychiatry you'd still have the same um kind of team but it might just be one extra person um, and so even if people had needed inpatient the same psychiatrist would be with them the same nurse would be with them um, and it wouldn't be a completely different team you'd see the same team throughout and I thought that was a really interesting approach because that's a really consistent approach to that kind of what we would call persistent distress and um, it's a consistent approach in the sense that you get the same people which means that there's less of that um that kind of um need to build trust with different people um and um yeah i feel like it it kind of helped um he said that it helped with help seeking behaviors because it meant that if you if you know you're going to have the same people then you you trust them you have a better rapport with them um that aspect of mutuality is there and um it you know often when it comes to um mental health treatment it's not only um like medication or anything that helps sometimes it's the relationship you have with with a mental health um clinician sometimes it's the relationship that makes you makes a young person understand you know if somebody cares about me this much maybe I can care about myself this much um and so um he had this really interesting view on um kind of how the um how clinical management was in terms of having the same team but also how relational working um you know impacts really good outcomes and that he he, he said um sometimes you've got to move away from the person and towards the relationship and in turn you will help the person um so it was a really interesting way of, of viewing things but it Thank you, Zizi. I love that approach of the same person staying with the young person. Like, there's so much to be said about consistency, and we've heard so much today about the importance of building those trusted relationships. Um, Chelsea, I'll come to you because I saw you took yourself off mute. Yeah, I had uh, two quick things. One thing that came to mind was thinking, it's interesting, I think about our country, CAMS, as much as I think with young people, and like actually loads of systems around them, but then CAMS, it's mostly like psychologists and psychiatrists. And so it's, it's actually not joined up, but I also work in adult services. So 
sex psychosis and there's a care coordinator, we have OTs, we have a, a wider MDT. And so even a smaller thing of actually having that joined up uh, in other countries, they do have more of a wider MDT supporting the family system connected, which can make a big difference. Um, but also I was kind of just thinking, evidence-based practice, I know it was highlighted earlier, but really thinking about practice-based evidence and actually what is at home in our country that there is a lot of inter, uh, innovative work either on the ground, but where do we look for evidence? I challenge everybody here of like, are we just looking at these journals with certain impact factor? We talk about power, there's power across professions. Youth workers have a relationship with young people that me as a psychologist, uh, as a teacher, et cetera, you'd never be able to have. They have their own journals, they have various reports. How are we actually, where are we looking for research and how do we take these, in, these innovative ideas or this practice, Project Futures work with Centre for Mental Health, I'm sure you've access. Where do we look to get these ideas, not just further afield, but at home? And then all of us have the power to bring that back to a team meeting. All these spaces are interventive, how I might talk about something in a team meeting or pass an email on to a colleague, seeing all of that as interventive. And so I was just kind of flagging, actually, yeah, what do we, where are we looking at home? And then how do we use that research and how exactly, Cassie, we're still fighting for funding each year. So yes, we need that wider funding, but actually how are we, where are we looking for research or what are we, uh, what are we um, heralding as the gold standard and ignoring all of that other work? Because it is about being responsive to the community that you're in, as well as having global or national strategies, you need to respond to um, disparity and resource and strength on the ground. Um, Brilliant. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And thank you all for your responses. We've had no questions put in the chat. So I think if it's OK, we'll move to, to close the session. Um, so thank you all so much today for your contributions. It's been an absolutely fantastic panel discussion and hearing about all the different approaches that you're all taking in your work. And I think that thanks has been echoed in the chat as well. We've had so many lovely comments just about how brilliant and fantastic you all are. Um, I think the reflection that I've got is that you've given me hope. I think sometimes working in children's mental health, you kind of feel like you're going on, you're trying to do an uphill battle and you're feeling like there's not a lot of change happening at a quick enough speed. But I think all of the approaches that you've shared and all the work that you're doing just really shows that we can do, do something different and we can be innovative in the support that we provide to children and young people. So thank you so much. Um, Zizi, particularly, thank you for sharing your lived experience with us today and Kane did as well. So I just want to recognise our thanks for that as well. Um, on the screen now are the um, uh, next Festival of Ideas events. Um, so we've got one on climate crisis in June and one on mental health services in July. So you can use the QR code that's on the screen um, to sign up. And you can also find out about the Centre for Mental Health's uh, series of Future of Ideas events on their website. And there is going to be a link in the chat. Um, and finally, a massive thank you to all of our attendees for coming along today and listening and um, taking on board some of these ideas. I really hope that it's been useful for you and given you all a little bit of food for thought about how we, what more we can be doing and how we can change our practice going forward. So thank you so much, everyone, um, for, your, for attending and for your time. And I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.